So allergic airway disease, this is about asthma, <laughs> but it's also about rhinitis, the hay fever, the season that we're just moving into. Allergic airway disease, one airway. And I'm gonna talk about a patient, the sort of patient that we all see in our practices. So this is John. I know you haven't got any handouts. Don't worry, just look at me because everything that I'm gonna talk about are in the guidelines. I'm not talking about anything that are just, I'd rather we had your thoughts and you came with me and thought through the problems. This is John. He's a young man. He's had asthma since he was a child. It doesn't give him a great deal of trouble now, but he does wheeze for a little while after he's had a cold um, and sometimes on exercise. However, for the last couple of months, he's noticed that his asthma has been coming. He's getting much more wheezy when he, he enjoys running and he's been getting a lot more wheezy. Okay. When you have a look at the computer, you can see that he's on beclomethasone. There's a prescription, a repeat prescription for beclomethasone, a couple of hundred uh, micrograms twice a day and salbutamol inhaler. Fairly typical story. Okay. So the question then is, what are you going to now do? He's come to see you, he's getting worse. You've got four options there. Are you going to increase his inhaled steroids? Give him a long acting beta agonist, tell him to use salbutamol before exercise or advise him that running possibly isn't the best exercise for him. Can we have some quick votes? Okay, we're going to take a long time here. You're all going to give him a long acting beta agonist. I mean, this one he's been doing for years anyway. Um, that one appeals to me, but not to some. Um, okay, so what you're going to do is give him a long-acting beta agonist. Sounds logical, and it's actually what the guidelines appear to tell you, isn't it? This is the latest version of the BTS sign guidelines, and if you look at it, short-acting beta agonist as required, he's got that. He's currently on this step with a low-ish dose of um, inhaled steroids. So the next step is, as you rightly told me, add a long-acting beta agonist. Can't fault your answer, really. There are more options, increasing doses of inhaled steroids, other options that you could add on. And then when things are getting really complicated, we can refer through to secondary care to see if there's anything else that we can do for him. So I agree, your gu the guidelines say exactly that. But before you do that, you're going to take a step back. Is it actually asthma that's causing his symptoms? It's not that long ago since I had a young man in a fairly similar situation. And when I did, he looked a bit pale and wan as he came in and I did his haemoglobin and it was six and he actually had an acute leukemia. Okay, so the first thing you do is to go back and just think, why has this got worse? Is it asthma or is it something else causing the problem? Never assume, just because he's got a diagnosis of asthma, that that's the cause of his symptoms. Maybe, but maybe not. Okay. You can see on the computer he had a repeat prescription for Clenil. Is he taking it? What do you reckon? Make a guess. 28-year-old man, is he taking his Clenil? No. no, probably not is the answer to that. This study, this is primary care data, um, and as you can see, less than half, that's 40%, 50%, less than half of patients, particularly in that young age group, are actually taking their inhaled steroids as prescribed. So the chances are he's not taking the inhaled steroids. So there's a point that you might want to pick up. Can he take his inhaled steroids? Here are some funny pictures for you. These came out of the various magazines that, you know, Pulse GP type magazines. I culled these. Where do these pictures come from? But have you seen patients actually doing that? If you haven't, you've never checked a patient's inhaler technique because people do do that. Okay, what's wrong with that? Can you see the puff? She's not inhaling it, she's puffing it out. What's wrong with that? Come on. She's Well, she's taking it like a meter dose inhaler, but it's actually an easy breathe. Yeah, look, there's the cap. Why has she done that? 
She's not been told, but it's even worse than that. Have you read the instructions for an easy breathe? Well, what it says, when you get your new pack, you know, you take the instructions out, and the first thing it says is take the top off and prime it. Well, she got that far with the instructions and then forgot to read the bit that said put the top back on and this is how you use it. Lots of people who are not instructed will do that with an easy breathe. What's wrong with that? Come on. She hasn't taken the cap off. And that? Far too young to be using a metered dose inhaler. Okay. Now that, an editor thought they'd put in an article I'd written about end of life COPD care. What a caring nurse. But what, that's not quite how I've always understood hand breath coordination. It's the nurse's hand and the patient's breath. But you see it with children too, don't you? Mum running around trying to puff into child's mouth. Check inhaler technique. The message is clear. Does he smoke? Because if he does smoke, even if he's taking in his, health, his inhaled steroids, they're not going to be working effectively. So if he's a smoker, that could be part of the problem. But of fact, of course, the problem is that he's running through grassy fields um, and he's actually got an allergic problem going on. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So before you put him on those long acting beta agonists, work through these key things first. And then we're ready to start thinking about what we might need to do. So what we're going to talk about is this concept of one airway and one disease. Because in fact, many people who have rhinitis have asthma and vice versa. These figures came from the latest version of the Basaki um, British guidelines. Rhinitis is strongly associated, about 80% of people with um, asthma report symptoms of rhinitis, and it's not very dissimilar the other way around. So rhinitis is a strong risk factor for, um, for new onset asthma. Now remember that, not only in the context of hay fever, but in the context of occupational um, disease. Occupational rhinitis frequently precedes occupational asthma. So that's an important clue. Why? Well, it's the same or very similar allergic process are typically eosinophilic. Um, the upper and the air, lower airway are actually continuous. There's a dividing line here, which is somewhat arbitrary. So we've got a, a continuous airway. And there's even some suggestion that because you've got a blocked nose with your rhinitis, you are now actually inhaling through your mouth because you can't breathe through your nose. Um, and of course, John's running and breathing it his allergens into his lungs anyway. So reasons why problems in the nose and problems in the lung actually one airway, one disease. And there's some good evidence from our prescribing data. Again, this comes from the sort of prescribing data that we produce in primary care, that people who have rhinitis and asthma are going to require more treatment to manage their um, their asthma. So they require more, um, what you wanted to do, put him on the ICS larva, the purple line. This is the line for the people who've also got rhinitis. That's the prescribing for the people who haven't. So people, it's a marker for requiring more treatment and more management. They also see us more. That's one more consultation a year for their respiratory conditions, um, five compared to four. So we see more of these people. They have a greater burden of disease. Asthma deaths. These are asthma deaths in Scotland over the last um, decade or so, plateaued pretty much. But I want to draw your attention to something which is actually quite interesting. This is the asthma deaths by season of the year. You're familiar with seeing it over the year. This is by season of the year. These are UK figures from January to December. Now, the age groups are different. This is the older age group, OK? And it peaks in January, December. Why? Infections, respiratory infections. It's what you'd expect. But if you look at the breakdown by younger age groups, so we've got the children at the bottom and we've got the young adults, you will see that it peaks in the summer, which is interesting. 
the question is why, and the supposition is that that is probably related to allergic conditions. I only have seasonal asthma is belittling what is a potentially serious problem. I mean, we hear it, oh, he hasn't really got asthma, he's got seasonal asthma. Yeah, but that's actually potentially quite a nasty problem. When you look at asthma deaths, this study was done in uh, East Anglia. There were, broadly speaking, two forms of um, two forms of, of story that you get. There's a story that actually you could have predicted this was going to go wrong. There's a long history um, where the patient is actually getting worse slowly over time. And you actually know they're poorly adherent, they've got problems at home, they've got severe asthma all along. A history of problems. Now that group of patients is the majority, but there are also patients who get their symptoms very suddenly with no apparent warning. Minority but probably highly allergic and very much in that younger age group. So if we look here at the peak over time, each of these are an individual, this is their age, okay, so an 11 year old, a 20 year old, a lot of them are younger people, and they died in the pollen season. There is one that didn't, number 51 at the end there who died in December and apparently um, she was at the horse of the year show and was known to be allergic to horses. So the argument still probably holds. These are probably acute allergic episodes. So what is the message for us as clinicians? We should check about rhinitis with every asthma review that we do. It should be there on our asthma review checklist um, and we should check for asthma in every hay fever consultation. Now my, the nurses who do my reviews I'm sure are very efficient at remembering that in the asthma review. I'm not sure I'm quite so efficient at asking about wheeze in the patient who just comes to me for hay fever. Um, or indeed let's be practical about this the person who doesn't come and see us about their hay fever but just says please can I have another prescription of my antihistamines or whatever it is they want. Does that happen in your practices? And how do we respond to that? We need to find out about whether they're wheezing as well. We need to assess both and treat for, the, um, for both conditions. Now assessment, this is going to be emphasized in the new um, updated BTS sign guideline that's going to be coming out later. Some of you may have read the consultation document, consultation version. We're going to be emphasizing that how's your asthma is not an adequate way of assessing asthma control. It tends to get the response fine. Um, we need to be asking specific questions about symptoms, about how it impacts on activities and about nighttime waking. Many of you are probably using things like the asthma control questionnaire or asthma control test in order to objectively assess control. And even if you're not using those, you're probably, um, there's a remnant, I know quaff doesn't actually still happen in Scotland, but you will all have probably got into the habit of, respond, of writing the quaff three questions, which of course reflect the sleeping, the activity levels and, and symptom control. So asking specific questions does matter. And we actually looked at whether those three questions correlated with those well-validated questionnaires. And they do. If somebody says no to all of them, so no, no interference with activities, I'm having no symptoms and I'm not waking at night, then they almost certainly had good control on their asthma control test um, when we did it. Similarly, if they responded yes to two of them or three of them, then they almost certainly, almost all of them have poor control. So positive results are highly significant. In between, it depends which one they tick. If they just tick one, if it's sleep disturbance or getting in the way of activities, then they're probably poorly controlled. If they're just getting occasional daytime symptoms, that might be compatible with good control. And you need to look at prescribing of um, short acting beta agonists um, and, and asking very specifically about symptoms and attacks, looking in more detail. So basically, if it's zeros, good. If it's got positive answers, think again. That person probably has poor control. And of course, in the context of John, he's probably scoring two positives on that. We don't know. We didn't ask him about his nighttime waking. He may even have three. So what about rhinitis? How do we assess rhinitis? 
Well, traditionally, this has been done by thinking in terms of whether rhinitis is intermittent or persistent. Um, it's quite complicated. There are some definitions here about four days a week and for four weeks of the year. So within a hay fever season, somebody who's suffering for four weeks on a regular basis has got persistent um, rhinitis symptoms. And then we think about the severity, whether it's affecting their life um, or whether they're actually just able to manage to get on with life. It's not disturbing their activities, their daytime activities or disturbing their sleep. And of course, you can mix and match those. So you can have mild persistence and <coughs> so on. So there's two things that we're thinking about. And in the case of John, he undoubtedly falls into this persistent and moderate to severe category. So back to my question, what are we going to do for him? Um, he's got moderately severe persistent um, allergic rhinitis. He's definitely got poorly controlled asthma. At the moment, all he's doing for his rhinitis is taking cetirizine. What do you want to do for him? I heard about the long-acting beta agonist. <coughs> what else do you want to do him? See if he's got polyps. Have a look up his nose. See if he's got polyps. Any other thoughts in terms of just... Rather than taking it as a PR and basis to take it regularly. He could take it regularly. Inhaled, Think about inhaled nasal steroids, various options. What might we go for? There was a bit of an idea. And I'm not sure it's actually yet a proven idea, but it's the idea that if it was one airway, maybe if we treat one part of it, the other bit would get better. And certainly, you know, you feel that, don't you? You treat somebody's rhinitis and somehow their whole symptoms all seem to come under control. And certainly if you haven't treated the rhinitis, it's very difficult to get control of the asthma. So th there is a sense that we'd like to try and control it all. But more recent evidence is quite equivocal as to how effectively that actually works. But well, we do need to treat both. Antihistamines, yes, they'll help his rhinitis, they'll have no effect on his asthma. But absolutely right, he needs more relief, perfectly reasonable for him to be taking them regularly. Uh, Non-sedating ones, of course. Um, what about nasal steroids? They work very effectively for the nose. Do they actually improve the asthma as well? Well, there are, this is the Cochrane Review, and I had a look last night to see if there was an updated version of this, because this is 2003. And actually, there's no updated version. There are very few trials. The ones that there are suggest, look, that diamond there is almost significant. It, there's a strong trend, but not quite significant to improving lung function by giving nasal steroids. And in terms of symptom scores, again, a trend which is nearly significant for improving the symptom scores by treating the nose. So we're using asthma symptoms by treating the nose. So maybe there is a bit of a signal there, but it's not absolutely clear yet. Clinically, I mean, you tell me, clinically, it feels as though that sometimes does help, but the evidence is less than perfect at the moment. So, certainly he needs his inhaled steroids and we need to address the issues that we've already discussed. He needs his nasal steroids. What about leukotriene antagonists? Nobody mentioned those. They have a role in, they help with the rhinitis symptoms. They're a potential alternative add-on in the guidelines. Um, According to the latest um, Bisaki guidelines, the therapeutic profile is very similar to antihistamines. So they are an alternative, putting the two together, adding adenine as an extra to antihistamines probably doesn't give much benefit, but they are an alternative and we know they have some effect on the lungs. So it's a potential way of treating both might be worth thinking about. And indeed, the guidelines do say it has a, may have a specific place in, in asthma patients with seasonal allergic rhinitis. So it's something to think about um, for, for, for John, if that's preferable. So that might be another option for him. Not that he's going to stop his inhaled steroids, note. Now, I'm not going to talk much about immunotherapy, but it is gaining credence. Um, at the moment, it's something that I think most of us in primary care would tend to refer through to a specialist clinic to think about. But the sublingual immunotherapy, as opposed to the subcutaneous, is something that's gaining some interest, I think is what I would say at this point. 
Certainly the Bisaki guidelines, the British rhinitis guidelines, are talking about subli um, sublingual immunotherapy as an effective and safe alternative for the treatment of allergic rhinitis. Um, even if a person has asthma, if you remember, the um, injectable forms are usually contraindicated or is delivered with great care in somebody with a history of asthma. So it might be an option if his, his management is, um, is very, very difficult. <laughs> Having said that, if you look it up in the Cochrane reviews, they're rather more circumspect. Lack of data for important outcomes such as exacerbations and quality of life. So they were rather less clear. Again, an emerging therapy, not something that I think I would want to be starting in primary care, but something that you might want to be aware of for patients where it's becoming particularly troublesome and ask your local allergy clinic whether it's an appropriate option for that patient. And of course, he needs some supported self-management. I'm going to talk a bit about that later on. The importance being that you need to include his rhinitis management in his asthma action plan. I'll come back to that. So um, I want to just talk then about another one of our patients and you'll be seeing a few of these, I'm sure. This is a 15 year old girl who's had hay fever for some years now. Um, she's come in to an emergency appointment, of course, um, and her mum would like a note, please, for the examination board for the exam she's taking that afternoon to say that her hay fever is terrible and she's therefore not going to perform very well. Does that happen? Yeah, okay. Um, so, the question, what are you going to do for her? You're obviously going to ask about her wheezing because I've already suggested that. Are you going to give her an antihistamine? She's taking that already. Recommend a nasal steroid? Well, possibly, but not, that's not going to help her for this afternoon. And otherwise, of course, you're going to um, charge her for a certificate. Is that right? Which of the options seem most appealing? It's actually a very real problem. You know, we're frustrated by it when this turns up in our morning surgery, when we know we could have prevented this problem from actually existing. But it's a real problem. This was a study that looked at a lot of students from quite a number of schools, 18 schools, and they compared the grades these children got for their mocks, which were early in the year, um, to the GCSEs that they were sitting in May and June. Okay. Now, what this showed was that if you had hay fever, you were more likely to drop a grade between your mocks and your exams. 40% more likely to drop a grade. If you were, had hay fever and were taking, and most of them were taking Kiriton, a sedating antihistamine, you were 70% more likely to drop a grade than a child who didn't have rhinitis and wasn't taking antihistamines. That is quite a significant risk. That's a case controlled study, okay? But nevertheless, there's a problem there. So this request is not particularly unreasonable, except that it would have been a lot better if we'd seen Becky a month ago and given her some appropriate treatment because then she wouldn't have needed to be in this situation at all. So how are we going to manage her hay fever? Well, allergen avoidance, I've never liked the idea of Vaseline up your nose, but there are ways of trying to avoid allergens. They are worse um, during certain times of day. You can, you know, you, there are pollen counts available and in a minute you're going to be hearing about how technology can help you predict those pollen counts. Um, so, you know, there are ways that she could have perhaps managed to avoid some allergens. But if she was having symptoms, she definitely should not have been having a sedating antihistamine. But why is that message not getting out there? They still are, aren't they? People are still buying these over the counter. I, the only way into that problem, in my mind, is to talk with the pharmacists, because they're the ones that are selling these products. Um, she should have been having a non-sedating antihistamine. And of course, there is um, a, an antihistamine um, nasal spray, which is effective as well, and another option. But quite probably what she needed was a nasal steroid spray, which taken from the beginning of the season would have probably prevented the problems. However, when you suggest that, through gritted teeth, because she's taken an emergency appointment for something that didn't need to be an emergency appointment, she said, oh, I've had one of those before. 
um, in the tone of voice that suggests she wasn't mightily pleased about being offered another one. They don't work. So the question is, why don't they work? Well, part of it, of course, is because people don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand how they work. There's an information gap there. These are not meant to make you feel better now. These are meant to be preventing your problems tomorrow. I mean, we have all this with inhaled steroids, don't we? So an information gap. Here are some useful resources for information. Her adherence to taking it is probably poor because if she doesn't understand how it's going to work, she's not going to be taking it regularly. I don't like using it. Um, do you know how to use a nasal spray? Has anybody ever told you how to use a nasal spray? One or two people are nodding. I hope I get this right. These are the instructions. Okay, shake the bottle. Take the lid off, I presume. Um, bring it down, All right, okay. Then, you, you, this is a bit complicated bit, I'm sorry, I'm just swapping hands here. You have to use your right hand for your left nostril. Yeah, okay. You put it in, tilt it this way, tilt it that way, squirt it once or twice, and then you change hands and do it in the other nostril. Okay. It's a bit complicated, isn't it? And I certainly cannot use my left hand to squirt into my right. I can do it this way around, but I can't do that. So it's a bit of a problem. And the reason for it, of course, is very simple. Your nose is that shape on the front of your face. But of course, there is a septum in the middle. So if you put your nasal spray in at that angle, you're squirting straight onto the septum. It drips straight back out again and potentially causes a nosebleed from Little's area on the septum. So that is all behind all this lot is the fact that they don't want you to squirt it inwards. They want you to squirt it outwards. And the way to do that, it seems, is to use the opposite hand, if indeed you can do that. Why they don't just explain, I don't know. So that's the message. So the first, I draw these pictures for people to go out with on the, you know, the counterfoil from the prescription. They go out with that little diagram because then at least they understand what they're doing. So that's rule number one. Don't squirt inwards, squirt upwards. The second one is don't sniff. Well, you do, don't you? If you put something up your nose and squirt it, what do you do? You go, and then you wonder why it's tripping down the back of your throat and it tastes horrid. And it's also bypassed the bit that needs it. So don't sniff and squirt it upwards. I know it's so basic, isn't it? But we spend time spending, teaching people to use inhalers. We don't necessarily spend time teaching people to use their nasal spray. If you are going to use nasal drops, that's the one where you stand on your head by one means or another. Um, it says here, choose any position you feel comfortable with. Do any of those positions look remotely <laughs> comfortable? <laughs> and then you have to stay there while it kind of drips around your nose. <laughs> Okay. But nasal drops will not be thinking of for uh, Becky, I don't think. And the next objection, steroids are dangerous. Okay, local side effects, nosebleeds, helps if you don't squirt it straight at your septum. Um, actually, septal damage is really very, very rare. But this is the one that we need to just think a bit about. The bioavailability, how much of that nasal steroid gets to the bit that you want to get it to in the nose and how much gets into the general system big difference here. The red one at the end are the nasal drops. They are very highly absorbed. Um, they are virtually all of it gets into the bloodstream, which is why we very rarely use nasal drops except in more extreme circumstances. We're probably giving systemic steroids by doing that. This group in the middle, something like a 30, 40, 50 percent bioavailability. And that's the one notice that you'd buy over the counter, Beckonase. Okay, this one, probably the most widely bought one over the counter, Nasabec, Beconase. Um, half of it gets into the bloodstream, so the bioavailability is quite high. Now, if you are, I and mean, it probably doesn't matter if you're talking about somebody like John who's only going to use it for a month of the year, maybe that's not such an issue. But it's quite a considerable issue in young children. <coughs> People are going to be using it for most of the year, many years. It's important that we think about it. And there are some, mametazone and the two forms of fluticasone, um, which actually have almost no bioavailability. So you're giving it to the nose and only the nose, which is really perhaps important. So whilst it probably doesn't matter for some people where you've got a higher risk, 
perhaps in Becky who's going to be using him, she's a young girl, you probably want to be thinking about these lower risk prescriptions. Okay. <coughs> Oh, I'm pressing the wrong one, aren't I? Um, so there we are. There's her treatment structure and plan again. Um, either way, we need to help her to monitor her symptoms um, and adjust the management accordingly. Um, and of course, in terms of her treatment, it's a question of stopping it at the end of the pollen season and then recommencing it prior to the season starting. And that's where watching the pollen counts or indeed being alerted, as you will hear in a minute, to the pollen counts could be useful. So, some take-home messages for you. Asthma and rhinitis commonly coexist. We should always ask about rhinitis in asthma consultations and about wheeze in rhinitis consultations. And we then need to treat, assess and treat both. Don't underestimate seasonal asthma. It's never only seasonal asthma. It's seasonal asthma that needs to be treated appropriately. Think about trigger avoidance and antihistamines are the first line of treatment, but remember that there are non-sedating astahistamines and if that's what we're using, then we certainly need to be thinking about the non-sedating form. Nasal steroids are safe and particularly remember that mimetazone, um, mimetazone and fluticasone are the safer of the options there and are effective at reducing a broad spectrum of those symptoms. I didn't point out that some antihistamines, for example, are good at the itch and the running noses, but they're not really very good at blockage. If you've got a blocked nose, you really need the nasal steroids. So it's a broader spectra treatment. It works better, it is more effective. But of course, you do need to learn to use it properly. So advising patients how to use it is really important. Um, and think about it in the context of self-management. Patients need to incorporate that into their self-management action plans. So a brief run through asthma in the context of rhinitis. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I've got time for a few questions or thoughts or observations. Is, is there any point in giving uh, or in performing eosinophil kinds for people with allergic rhinitis? Okay, eosinophils will often be high, will they not, in an eosinophilic type problem? So, yes. Does anybody want to make an observation to that? Let's have a discussion. Would an eosinophil account change how you manage Becky? Not Becky, perhaps. Any other thoughts? John, would it have helped in John's case? Where we've got a bigger differential diagnosis. See, I th my thought here would be that the eosinophil count may well, if you're not sure whether this is an allergic rhinitis, a raised eosinophil count would be in favor of it. It wouldn't prove the diagnosis, but it would nudge you towards thinking that. So in the case of John, where you might have been not sure what the cause was of his breathlessness, I think it might have helped. With Becky, with her classic symptoms, I think the question is whether it would have made any difference to how you managed her. The other thing about a eosinophil count, and it's potentially important, that's at the almost the opposite statement, is that a very raised eosinophil count is almost certainly associated with an increased risk of acute asthma attacks. So if it was very raised, yes, it would alert you to a, a more severe problem. But in reality, with Becky, I don't think it would make much difference to how you managed her. What do other people think? Would it have helped you? Okay, another point. I saw, I'm sure I saw somebody's hand over here. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, if someone has um, asthma with seasonal allergic rhinitis and you want to, uh, say a child or a smaller person, and you wanted to prescribe uh, a nasal steroid, would that be reasonable to do it just for certain times of the year? Is that what you would expect? Just, yeah. yeah. And then take them off sort of March to October. And yeah. Then yeah, I mean, Becky would be the classic example of that. She gets it in the hay fever season. So she would start in April and she'd finish in end of July, August. Of course, sometimes the season doesn't correspond to grass pollen. 
um, sometimes it's tree pollens early in the year or it's the fungal spores later. So you need to be quite clear which times of year somebody is getting the problems. But once you've clarified what season it is that's troubling them, yes, they can start and stop accordingly. And that would apply to the inhaled steroids as well as to the nasal steroids if they were having no symptoms for the rest of the year. Any other question down here, Lara? Are parenteral steroids in or out at the moment? Sorry? Parenteral steroids. What, to give her a course of oral steroids? No, I mean, like, we, every year I will get somebody coming asking for IM Kenalog. Uh, yeah, well, the answer to that is no. Uh, no to the patient, that is. Um, we're not using, there's no point in IM Kenalog. It, it has side effects. You're, you're giving systemic steroids, aren't you, for a, um, a very variable way of giving them. And there have been a lot of problems with that. So the answer to that is no. Is there a case for using a course of oral steroids? Occasionally, somebody has got devastating rhinitis. It's not an it's not an impossible thing to do. Now, if Becky had was really in big trouble, she was wheezing, she's streaming out, she got eyes, you know, it really was dreadful. And it was three or four days before her big exams. Then it's not unreasonable to think about whether a course of oral steroids was the right thing to do. But you don't often need it for hay fever, do you? But no, Kenalog injections, no. I think that's a full stop. <laughs> doesn't even actually, interestingly, it, I don't think it's even mentioned now in the Bisaki guidelines that I was looking at last night. But you've still got people wanting it. Yes, we've had it before. Nothing mm. else. Nothing else works, does it? No, because they're basically having a oral steroids um, on a, and often it works for what, four, five, six weeks, and then they need another one to see them through the season. So effectively, they're having oral steroids for the course, for three months of the year, two to three months of the year. You wouldn't give somebody prednisolone for two to three months of the year. So the answer is no. It's one of the two reasons that people have slammed doors on me, patients that is. One is declining um, diazepam. <coughs> or Mogadon, as it used to be, Mogadon, Nitrazepam, okay? I'm not giving you any more sleeping tablets, door slamming. And the other is um, not giving somebody a Kenalog injection, slam the door and find somebody who will, yeah. <laughs> Hard to resist. Any other questions or comments? Does anyone to contribute? How do we manage that practical problem that I highlighted about the patient who's asking for antihistamines or perhaps a nasal steroid um, without actually seeing us, the repeat prescription scenario? How do we manage that on a practical level in practices? How many of you are working in general practice? Right, okay, so how do you manage it in your practice? What tends to happen is, uh, <laughs> what tends to happen is um, if they have a drug review mm. in October, November, December, January yeah. um, or February and they've not used it for several months, somebody will go, oh, well, they're not using that. I'll take off their yeah, cetirizine, yeah. their nasal spray, their whatever. And so you get the phone call um, yep. <coughs> once they've all got symptoms coming okay. back saying they need an emergency appointment or, you know, I just need my tyrosine nasal spray. Whatever. So is that a good thing? I, I suppose in some ways it is because you got an opportunity to review it. Yeah. However, there is a temptation that you've got the message to phone, needs antihistamine and nasal spray, you go, well, there's a prescription, I don't need to phone it. Yeah, I know, that's the problem, isn't it? Anyone really else want to contribute about the practicalities of this? I think it is a problem and I think you know we're, we're busy very busy and a prescription for something we know somebody's got the temptation is always to write it out I had a bit of a compromise situation because I haven't got time to phone up everybody who asked for a hay fever prescription in the hay fever season it's just not going to happen um, so what I used to do was to have a message that I used to put on the counterfoil that says, um, I, no, I'm sorry your hay fever is causing you problems again. Here's the prescription you request. Um, if you start to get a tight chest or feel wheezy, it's really important that we see you. 
Now, I don't know how many patients ever read it, but at least I tried to get that message across. I don't know. Simple, a simple idea that took no time, but at least alerted people. <laughs>